So now I'm going to turn to uh, Ian Fairley, who is a radiation biologist and independent consultant. He's uh, spent more than uh, 12 years working for the British government and is now retired and is going to speak on the nuclear disaster of Fukushima, nuclear source terms, and initial health effects. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, how do I follow those two excellent speeches? Huh? Uh, very moving indeed. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to Helen and to PSR for organizing this great symposium. I'm, uh, I'm going to be discussing um, perhaps uh, a couple of the most important aspects uh, of Fukushima. One is the, the source term actually what actually happened, what came out, and secondly, I'm going to make a stab at trying to estimate some of the health effects from the uh, uh, fallout from Fukushima. Um, this is what I'm going to be discussing. I'm going to be looking at some photos of the disaster, some maps of the fallout dispersion, some of the, uh, chat about some of the source terms although there's uh, quite a lot of question about them. And then I'm going to be going on to the health effects, the initial health effects, which we're already seeing, and what to expect in the future. And then I'm going to finish, uh, finish with collective doses. Um, yesterday afternoon, David uh, Remner came and talked about the importance of population doses. That's the same thing as collective doses. Um, this is the uh, earthquake. Uh, um, March 2011. Um, I'm going to run some, we've seen some of these before. Um, this is uh, Fukushima Daiichi. Is that better? Um, this is the uh, tsunami hitting uh, Fukushima. That's been seen before. This one hasn't. This uh, shows the uh, height of the surge, over 130 feet high hitting the seawall, and this shows the, uh, uh, the water surging through the plant. This is about 30 feet high, the water wall going through. Um, these are photographs of uh, the interior of the plant, um, showing uh, the water, particularly in the, the bottom three slides, D, E, and F, um, submerging important equipment. On March the 12th, it was a explosion at the, uh, Unit 1. And March, two days later, March 14th, another, an explosion at Unit 3. You can see it's quite different from the explosion. I'll just point out uh, here, this, deb this debris here is, is huge. And uh, in a future slide, I'll show you what, uh, what the effect is of the, this massive amount of uh, debris going up. The next thing is that on March the 15th, and this is not really very clear, uh, TEPCO do their best to try and hide this, but about uh, just shortly after 6 o'clock in the morning, Japanese time, there was a quote-unquote explosive event in the fuel pond at Unit 2, and that was followed seconds later by another explosive event in the spent fuel pond at Unit 4. So these two events on the 15th that were in, very, very intimately connected, and we don't know the reason why yet. And then the uh, next day on March the 16th, again, uh, early in the morning, there was a major explosion at Unit 4, and that's the fuel point. Those two ex um, explosions on the 15th and 16th were not videotaped because it was dark and there was no TV crews actually taking um, uh, footage at the time. Um, this gives a, a timeline of the various explosions. Um, I should say, and I would uh, re sort of reflect what um, 
Arnie Gardnerson said that there's a lot of questions yet. You know, many emissions and high radiation levels which are still unexplained. Um, we're still, in, only two years after the accident, we're still piecing things together. And TEFCO is running interference and making damn sure that we don't find out what's going on. But nevertheless, um, if we can look here at the damage to, we've seen some of these before. Um, this is, oh, sorry. And these are the, uh, the damage to the reactors 4, 3, 2, and 1. 4, 3, 2, and 1. Um, and going on from the uh, top, um, these are the reactors 3, 2, and 1. 3, 2, and 1. And you can see here, you can see here, this, these holes and the turbine holes are a result of the falling debris from the reactor. These are huge holes, about 20, 30 feet in diameter, which means that big chunks of the reactor um, and or fuel pond went straight up into the air. And yes, you heard yesterday Arnie Gunderson say that he thought that perhaps there was a criticality involved, but that was a minority view. Well, I share that view. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a minority. There's a, quite a bit of evidence suggesting that something more than a hydrogen explosion took place. Of course, <laughs> of course um, the officials, uh, TEPCO and the Japanese government agencies, deny it. But um, there's far too much plutonium and uh, uranium lying around the rest of Fukushima for there not to have been a criticality accident. Uh, 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 event, I should say. So we'll see in future what actually happens. Again, more the damage from, uh, to reactors four and reactor three. So just to recap what happened. There was four, ex at least four explosions in the reactors at units one, two, and three, and, uh, uh, and the spent fuel pond at unit four. There was um, overheating in the four uh, spent fuel ponds, and there was a fire in Unit 4. There were cold core marathons in reactor in Units 1, 2, and 3, and we don't really know where the fuel, the melted fuel is. It's probably the, the basements of the 1, 2, and 3, but we're not absolutely sure. Many workers were, uh, suffered very high radiation levels, 250 millisieverts plus, um, big uh, evacuations, as well, we we'll go on to that. About 12,000, putting some numbers, 12,000 workers were exposed. Um, about 100,000 people were evacuated. Lots, lots of contamination of uh, food and water. And about 8% of Japan's surface area was contaminated. These are the evacuation areas, They're color coded so you can follow them. I think that rather than me just discussing this in great detail, if you want to, you can download this or you'll be given copies of it so you can study it at your leisure. But the, um, the pink, the green, and the uh, purple areas all had different uh, parameters about when and uh, the numbers of people who were evacuated. Here again, more precise data uh, about evacuation numbers and zones. This is um, a photograph, uh, uh, an image from um, surveys done by U.S. military, basically, um, of helicopters about 100 meters above the surface, measuring le cesium levels, uh, both 134 and 137. And you can see here um, a distinct horseshoe-shaped um, pattern of um, deposition from the plumes at Fukushima. Also, you can see there's um, quite a lot of population centers. These are the, uh, the purple colored, colored areas here. Oh, jeez. Um, here, 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 here. These are high population areas. You say, well, why are you mentioning population areas? Because it's where there's high populations that you get the deaths. And it's where you get high population doses. It's people that count. 
If the radiation falls in an area where there, nobody lives, then we're perhaps less concerned. It shows some of the dose levels similar to the previous slide, but given some numbers uh, of the doses. Um, as you can see, oh, God. As you can see here, we're talking about doses of up to millisieverts, 50 millisieverts a year. None of that is taken into account in the recent WHO report, which uh, is a disgrace in many ways. Um, but going on, this slide is on its side. I couldn't, for the life of me, get it to go up and down, <laughs> north and south. But can you imagine, this is... Oh, God. Um, this is the curve here of the, that I showed you before, the horse-shaped shoe shape. Now, this is... Here is Greater Tokyo, a population of 35 million or so. And you can see yeah, that parts of, of uh, Tokyo were contaminated. Now, even if um, the population of Tokyo only got an average dose of a, of a millisiever, say, that's still a huge dose in terms of, of um, the um, population doses, 30,000 person savers is very large indeed. Just going on. It wasn't just Japan, it was the rest of the world. And this shows you the contamination as measured by Stoll and his associates in Norway. Stoll, is, he's an important person for you to try and remember his name. S-T-O-H-L. Um, they used data from the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization measurement stations throughout the world. Makes me wonder why it didn't occur with Chernobyl, but anyway, they did it for, um, uh, for Fukushima, and you can see um, the deposition throughout the rest of the world. Essentially, what this slide shows is that every single one of us has bought a, a reverse lottery ticket do you remember what uh, David Brenner said yesterday about uh, the fact that um, if you're spreading very small doses over a large population, it's basically a reverse lottery ticket. And like a real lottery ticket, some people are going to get it. Some either, with a, an ordinary lottery ticket, you won the jackpot, but with a reverse lottery ticket, you die. We don't know who it is, and the risk could be, individual risks could be very small, but people will die. And that's why collected doses are really important to, to measure. We live in a society, in a capitalist society, where we value individual freedoms and individual rights and individual doses and put a lot of emphasis on it. Yeah, okay, but collective doses are important too. So if you pick up nothing else from this conference, please try and remember that we should try emphasize collective doses. And I'll give you another reason why, and that is that the World Health Organization and UNSCARE and IEA are all trying to downplay collective doses. 